All right, let's find our seats and open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. And let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. Thank you that you have revealed so much um, as we as we go through these the letters to these churches and we realize just how helpless we are and, and would be were it not for your word and for your Holy Spirit. The, the difficulties that these churches faced and endured, the hazards that they encountered, the, uh, the pitfalls that they encountered, all of which we, we face today. And so, Father, as we, as we look into your word, I pray that you would bring us face to face with our natures, to however these impact us individually and corporately, that we would be quick to turn back to you. Help us to see you this morning in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we are going to look at two churches again. We're going to look at the church of Thyatira, and then we are going to look at the church in Sardis. Uh, As we've talked about before, these these seven churches are basically in the shape of a horseshoe. And beginning at Ephesus, you have Ephesus, Smyrna is a little to the north, Pergamum further to the north, and now we are turning inland, and we are going to go to Thyatira. So let's read the letter to Thyatira. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds, and your love, and faith, and service, and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Now, last week when we looked at Smyrna, we noted that Smyrna was the shortest letter of the seven churches. Thyatira is the longest. And so Thyatira is modern day Akisar, in Turkey. It's located about 40 miles southeast from Pergamum. And Thyatira is on a plain, and it doesn't have any natural defenses. In fact, Thyatira was the first line of defense for Pergamum. So Thyatira was, they, they got beat up 
a lot. So if somebody was coming after Pergamum, they'd go through Thyatira. Thyatira, if, you know, for those of us who are a little older, Thyatira was kind of like Tokyo with Godzilla. If you remember the Godzilla movies, you know, that was Thyatira. They kind of got beat up and laid waste by all kinds of people. Now, Thyatira was different than some of the other cities uh, that we see letters to. They d were not a great center for emperor worship. Now, that doesn't get them off the hook for idolatry because they had plenty of that when it came to um, pagan deities. They had a temple to Apollo, the Greek sun god. They were known for their trade guilds. Now, does anybody remember talking about trade guilds back when we were in school? And I'm talking about middle school and high school. Anybody remember talking about trade guilds? Trade guilds were kind of the forerunner for labor unions. And so when you were a member of a guild, um, number one, you were talking about all of the people that were uh, in that particular skilled craft. So you might, you might have a, a jeweler would be, they had a guild. If you were a potter, you, you had a guild. If you were a, a worker in uh, different types of things, you had your guild. And so there was kind of built-in quality control. And there was also, you had your own idols. You had your own deities. And uh, as, a, as a member of the guild, uh, you couldn't buy and sell unless you had the blessing of the guild and you were following after their rules. And so when they would have their, um, their celebrations of their particular deity that would be marked by certain characteristics that were typical of the day, you would have... Um, an altar, you would be making sacrifices, and so you would have things that were being offered to that deity. And many of them um, had ritualistic um, prostitution. That was actually a form of worship. And so if you were a Christian businessman in Thyatira, there was a lot of pressure on you. Either you conform to the way that they do things, or it's very, it becomes very, very difficult for you to stay in business. You'll remember uh, Paul's first convert in Philippi was a woman, and her name was Lydia, and she was a seller of purple, and she was from Thyatira. And so she was over uh, you know, on the other side of the sea there, um, selling her wares there. So Jesus introduces himself to this church, and he, he does what he has done with other letters. He goes back to the description in chapter 1, and he grabs on to two things, and he changes a third. So the two that he keeps, he keeps that he's got eyes like a flame of fire and he's got feet like burnished bronze. The idea of eyes like fire, uh, he sees everything. He misses nothing. And the idea of burnished bronze um, in the temple what items, what, what one specific item was made of bronze? The laver. Well, the laver and what else? The altar. The altar. And when you, talk, when you start talking about uh, sacrifices, what's the, what is the idea? What is the overhanging idea when you think about, I need to go in and make sacrifices in order to make some type of atonement for my sin? It's the concept of judgment, right? I am having to come face to face with a holy God who I have offended by my conduct. And so I am going to bring 
the, the, the sacrifice that is going to appease that deity, that God. And so you have the idea here that God sees everything and God is going to bring to account those who violate his law. He changes something too. So if you flip back, just turn the page and go back to chapter one. Look at verse, uh, we'll start at verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. Now Jesus does not introduce himself as the son of man to Thyatira. Who does he introduce himself as? I'm the son of God. And so, here you have again, you have these deities that are being worshiped on behalf of the unbelievers in Thyatira, and Jesus distinguishes himself from them. You know, these are little g gods, which in fact are gods not at all, right? As compared to, here is Jesus as, I am the son of, of God. And so when I am speaking to you, I have the authority of God because I am God. And so people in Thyatira, when they receive this, should be looking at it like uh, we've used this example before E.F. Hutton. Again, those of us who are older, when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen, right? The restaurant comes to, well, my broker's E.F. Hutton, and <laughs> dead silence, right? Because everybody's listening. That's, what, that's how these people should be viewing what Jesus is about to say to them. So, he begins. He's got his, he has a commendation for this church. I know your deeds, so I know your works. I am aware of those things that you are doing on my behalf and your love. And, and, and the idea here is there, there's actually the pronoun attached to each one of these. I know your love. I know your faith. I know your service. I know your perseverance. And so this is the first church that we've run into where he actually speaks of, I know about your love for me. And these are the common words for these two. Love is agape. Faith is pistis. Service is diakonia. So what word do we get from that? Deacon. Perseverance, hupomone, again, keeping the shoulder under. Uh, just the, 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 the staying on and the endurance of affliction and just moving forward. They have all of those things. And they have something else. And I know that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Now, this is separating them from which church? Which was the church that, had, that started well and they were faltering? Ephesus. Ephesus, right. You've left your first love. Thyatira doesn't have that problem. And so when you look at Thyatira, you see people who are actively serving Christ. And they are serious about it. And they are busy on it. They are uh, carrying on. Their fervor is increasing with time. And so you look at this and you think, wow, would you like Jesus to make that comment about our church? Boy, I sure would rather have that comment than the one that he gave to Ephesus, right? Repent or I'm gonna come, I'm gonna take your lampstand. And so it's an active church and you look at this church from the outside and 
man, this is, this is a church that we would want to be like. Except there's a problem, isn't there? But I have this against you. That you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. What's their problem? They have in their midst somebody who is a false teacher who is spouting forth false doctrine and they are tolerating her. They're not opposing her. They're not opposing her teaching. They're not separating her from their midst so that she does not continue to infect the people who are there. Now, whether or not this woman is actually named Jezebel, uh, their commentators are split, and, and I know you're surprised. I know you're terribly shocked to hear me say words like, you know, commentators are split on this issue. It seems that commentators are split on just about everything from one, you know, in one way or another. Now, when you hear the name Jezebel, what image comes to your mind? Say it louder. Ahab's wife. In fact, if you go back, Ahab's wife uh, is present in 1 Kings from chapter 16 all the way th uh, through chapter 22, the end of the book, and then she meets her end in 2 Kings chapter 9. Ahab was a wicked king, and kind of the capstone, kind of his crown for being a knucklehead evil king is that he married Jezebel. She's that bad. She was the one who really pushed uh, incorporating worship of Baal. And she was the one, you know, so when, uh, when Elijah is meeting the 400 prophets of Baal on top of Mount Carmel, who is their patron? Jezebel. And so it's going back and it's tying into this idea of having somebody who is anti-God and who is wanting to influence others in order to get them to where they are anti-God. The word here for leading astray is the word from which we get our word planet. Now we understand in our day and age because you know, we've got telescopes and we can track all these things. We know that planets have their own orbits, right? But back in the, in the ancient world, they would look and they would see a constellation and then they would see this other bright light in the sky that wouldn't stay with that constellation. It's, it's, it's all over the place. And so the idea there came to be that that was wandering. So these, these lights that are in the heaven, they wander. They're not tight like the others. And, that's be, and, and of course, that's because the planets are much closer to us than the stars are. And so, of course, their orbits are different and they move differently in time and space. So what is Jezebel's false teaching? She's encouraging those who follow her to engage in acts of immorality and to eat meat that's sacrificed to idols. Now, we, we saw this last week in Pergamum, right? We dealt with this issue when, when Jesus was dealing with this issue with Pergamum. And he named it differently there. There he was talking about, you have those who hold to the teaching of Balaam. And then he mentions, and you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, this idea that you can do whatever you want and you can get away with it because you can be forgiven, right? And so we looked at the idea of licentiousness. This, uh, and again, licentiousness is not a Christian it's not a godly characteristic. 
If we saw, we looked at the book of Jude where it talks about these people are referred to as ungodly, right? That is an ungodly characteristic. And so if you find yourself um, looking at different temptations and thinking it's okay if I do this because God will forgive me, that is danger Will Robinson territory. So they're tolerating her. Ephesus had good doctrine, but they had no fervor. Thyatira's got the fervor, but they're embracing false doctrine. And God takes that seriously. So notice how he deals with Jezebel. Verse 21, I gave her time to repent. She doesn't want to repent. So, God is simply going to take action against her. I'm gonna throw her on a bed. Now the idea here, you'll notice uh, that of sickness, uh, does everybody have of sickness in, in italics in their Bible? Okay, those words are supplied. The word here for bed, um, you'll also see it uh, translated pallet. It's used eight times in the New Testament. Most often, it is referring to um, a bed that someone who is sick or someone who has a disease is on. The paralytic that the, the guys dug through the hole in the roof in order to lower him down in. He had a pallet, that's this word. And so it's implied that it's of sickness. The implication here, adultery is usually tied to a bed, right? And the idea here is that this woman is leading God's people into idolatry, into immorality. And so he's going to judge her in that way. And her judgment is fixed. She's been given time to repent. She hasn't repented. And so God is going to bring about judgment on her. And that is impending doom. Um, in my old life, when I was a, an EMT, uh, we would go often to, to different homes, and you could tell when somebody was having the big one. They would present a certain way physically, uh, skin's cold and clammy, um, you know, they, they're having pain, and one of the, there was a look that they would often have, and that look was the look of impending doom. The, and they see it. It's here. Um, you, you, you've seen it on television when somebody has died on television because they're having a heart attack. And, and you look at the look and you go, that's the look. She's better have that look because the doom is coming for her. What's God gonna do about the people who she is infecting? For them, two things. Number one, he's gonna bring tribulation. Those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Great tribulation, so tribulation is our word flipsis, right, pressure. And great is the word mega. Now, this isn't referring to the great tribulation. We're going to talk about that in particular in a couple of weeks. He's going to bring pressure on the people who are following her, who are falling prey to her, to what it is that she's pitching. So he's gonna bring pressure. And those who will not repent, he's gonna kill them. Because when it says here, and I will kill her children with pestilence, the word here for children is technon, but the idea is her followers, those people, her, her disciples. You'll remember that the apostle John, when he was writing his letters, how would he refer to 
uh, the people to whom he was writing. My little children, exactly. So these are the people who are following her. This word pestilence, it's literally, I will kill them with death. Does that get your attention? Who comes to mind when you hear the idea of these are people who go to church? I'm going to kill them with death. Who does that bring to mind? Say it louder. Ananias and Sapphira. Absolutely. Acts chapter 5. They lied. In church, they represented something as true that wasn't. And God got the attention of those in that early church, didn't he? When he struck them dead on the spot. He got their attention. That's going to be the intention here. And that's not a unique Occurrence When you go to 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is writing about uh, taking communion, about the Lord's Supper, he talks about those who have done that in a wrong way. And how does he refer to them? Some of them are sick and some of them are asleep, which is the nice way of saying they're dead. Now, is, is, is sickness always because of judgment for sin? No, it's not. But sometimes it is. And again, this isn't pointless. And it isn't God being petulant either. He's doing this for a purpose. And the purpose is and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. God takes your pursuit of personal holiness seriously. And if you name the name of Christ, God will bring chastisement. And that chastisement can be anything up to and including taking you out. It got real quiet in here. And so again, yeah, God takes sin seriously. That's right. In Hebrews, everyone who comes to him, who he loves, he disciplines. And so, again, does God bring, uh, does, <laughs> with what's going on in Ukraine, this is probably a good example. Does God just come out with the nuclear weapon to begin with? No, he doesn't. He, he starts and he brings pressure. And he will turn up that pressure and just keep turning it up and dialing it up because what is it that he's after? He's after repentance. He's after we come, you know what? I'm tired of fighting. You know, yeah, I'm wrong. I'm, 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 I'm sinning here and I need to turn from my sin. And so again, God is about maintaining purity in his church. We're to maintain purity in this church. That is all of our responsibility. It's not just the pastors. It's everybody here. We are to be concerned about the purity of God's church. We're not the only ones. God, God is as well. There's a number of verses, if you want to follow this idea about it's God who searches the hearts and the mind, um, this word that's translated mind here is actually 
the Greek word for kidneys, nephros. The idea was is that uh, it's, it's your bowels, it's, it's your person as you are, um, as you are considering. So it's not just your affection, it's, 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 it's all of you. And so if you can go back, Jeremiah 17, 10, to grab one for the, from the Old Testament, there are plenty more that you can go through and find. Get a chain reference Bible and, and go through and you can follow that chain. It, it, is, it's, it has some interest for you. It has some value for you. You'll also find that Romans 8, 27. And so, again, it, it, it carries through. Now, has everybody in Thyatira fallen into this sin? No. This is some. It's not all. You have some who have done this. Those of you who are not entangled in this, you hold fast to what you have. And again, this idea of holding fast is you've got a death grip on it so that it doesn't get, you, it does, you cannot get dislodged from it. Verse 24, but this I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Now, it is possible that this is sarcasm. The deep things of Satan. It's unique language. It's not something that's used um, anywhere else, frankly, in the New Testament. You know, what comes to Mary? Mary? Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, the verse that comes to my mind, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should be his counselor? Who has first given to him that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. You want depth? You go to God. God's deep. God is unsearchable. You never plumb the depth there. Satan can't hold a candle to him. Verse 26, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end. Are those two different things or are those two ways of saying the same thing? Yes. Oh, Justin, come on, come on. <laughs> okay, in some way, yes, in some way. Here's the idea, he who overcomes one of the ways that you demonstrate that you are an overcomer is you do what God says and you do it faithfully and you finish that way. That's one of the signs of that. And so, to him who overcomes, who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the nations, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. Um, in your Bibles, is that in all caps? Or somehow set apart? Where's that quote from? Just look up and pull the little letter. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? Right? And the kings devise vain things, Brian. I think overcomes though also implies you have an opposition. Oh yeah. I, I mean, you didn't just keep the beat, but you exactly. I don't know if everybody heard that for the purpose of the tape. Overcoming anticipates 
opposition. In fact, really, to overcome, you have to have opposition, right? You've got to have something that's pushing back the other way. This word here, in verse 27, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, that word that's translated rule is also translated to shepherd. Jezebel is shepherding people badly. She is shepherding them, she is guiding them, she is encouraging them, she is leading them into sexual immorality and sin. Those who overcome, you are, they are going to be those who shepherd rightly, who lead to truth, who lead to that which is proper. And actually, that's a, that's a, that's a picture of the millennial kingdom. We'll get into that in, in weeks to come. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. Now, we talked about planets, right? There is a particular planet that is called the morning star. Which one is it? Anybody know? It's Venus. Because Venus is nearby, it tends to be very bright. It tends to be very remarkable because it's close. Referred to as the morning star. Do you know that Lucifer... Lucifer is one of the names for the devil. That name is about a star. In fact, in Latin, it is the Latin term for Venus. If you go back and look at Isaiah 14, 12, and in fact, you'll see it in other places where it, we'll see it later in Revelation, where um, the dragon goes up and wipes out a bunch of stars. He's referring to demons there in that location. Jezebel, she gets her alliance with the devil. Those who overcome, they get Jesus, the true morning star. Questions on Thyatira? Fervent church. But they're believing some of the wrong things. Chapter 3. We come to Sardis. Now we're starting to come further south. So we've gone north. We've gone inland over to Thyatira. Now we're starting back down. The other side of the horseshoe. Thyatira, or excuse me, Sardis is the modern day city of Sart. It's about 35 miles southeast of Thyatira, 50 miles east of Smyrna. Now, Sardis is the opposite geographically of Thyatira. Three kids in a wheelbarrow could overtake, could overpower Thyatira, all right? They don't have any natural defenses. Sardis, on the other hand, oh, ho, ho, ho. if you want safety, Sardis was your place. There were two parts of Sardis. There was the valley down below, and then there was a three-sided, um, oh gosh, you would see something like this in Lord of the Rings, where there's just this huge precipice that goes up. Three sides are like that. You can only come around on one way to actually get up, so the, fort, the, the, the defenses for Sardis are focused on that one approach point. And it was considered to be impregnable. So if you were Lord of the Rings, that's going to be the keep, right? That's the place where you go when everything's bad. That's where you head because we can defend that successfully. And that was the thought when it came to Sardis. That was the thought. We'll get to that in just a second. It was the center of the wool dyeing industry in the area. And so it was said that they had figured out how to dye wool, which had been difficult prior to that, to, only to some degree, because, I mean, you talk about with Joseph and his coat of many colors, you know, what was Abraham doing, to, or excuse me, not Abraham, uh, what was Jacob doing to the, to, the, to the wool? 
you know, he's dyeing it. He's, he's making it different colors. So that's, that's, that's their claim to fame um, in a commercial sense. And the other thing that was present there at Sardis was gold. Sardis was the Placer County of the Middle East. So when you talk about, you know, gold being present in the rivers and them going out there and being able to mine it out of there, that's Sardis. Now, Sardis, they think they're impregnable. And so, because these precipices are so steep, they don't even guard them. Now, if you have an avenue of approach that you do not watch, then what had you might as well be when it comes to alertness, asleep? Hold that thought. History tells us that Croesus was the king of Sardis. He goes over and he picks a fight with Persia, with Cyrus, and he gets beat up over in Cyrus, and so he retreats to Sardis. He goes home to his castle, where he's going to be safe while he kind of regroups so that he can go over and try again. What he was not anticipating was that Cyrus was going to follow him. So Cyrus brings his army, and Cyrus has got his army down here, and they're looking up this 1,500-foot cliff, trying to figure out, all right, how are we going to do this? And a soldier up on the top lost his helmet, his helmet falls off, drops down. There was a path. You couldn't see it from the bottom, but there was a way to get down. And so the soldier, thinking he's being sly, climbs down, gets his helmet, and climbs back up. Unfortunately for him, unfortunately for Croesus, there was a soldier in the Persian army watching. So they climb up, they follow that path. Nobody's watching it. A five-year-old could have raised the alarm of the Persian army climbing that cliff. But there were no five-year-olds watching. And so all of a sudden, the first thing they realize, the first uh, warning they have is, there's a bunch of Persians in the camp. And they were conquered. And then it was done again. And so all of a sudden, this air of invincibility there no more. Now, how does Jesus introduce himself here? Chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis, right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this. Again, going back to and capturing language from chapter 1. Now, the idea of the seven spirits, going back to chapter 1, what was that? Are there seven Holy Spirits? No, there's one. What's the idea in the seven spirits of God? Completeness and full coverage. The Holy Spirit is not like your cell phone. Hey, I've got five bars here. But if I... <laughs> okay, maybe not here. Maybe not here. But you know, five bars here, one bar here, and all of a sudden then you get someplace and I got no signal. Trust me, I run into that a lot. I've got AT&T. And so you don't have that when it comes to the idea of the seven spirits of God. God has got five bars everywhere. Nowhere is there a place where he doesn't see. Nowhere is there a place that he is not in full and complete control. That's the idea of the seven spirits of God. And again, he has the seven stars. Well, who did the stars? Who were the stars? That's the elders of the churches. God has got them, and in fact, Jesus had them in his right hand. And so the idea is he has control, he has power, he is able to um, to dictate, he is able to accomplish his purpose in these people. And so again, the, he has full and complete control. He's got full knowledge. 
He knows those who are His. The Lord knows those who are His. And He keeps them. Again, if it was up to you and me, we would be lost. So, I've got control of the churches. I see everything. I I understand motives. I understand all of that. And he says this. I know your deeds. That you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. They have a reputation. But the reputation doesn't match the substance. If you look at this church from the outside, you would be you would think these guys have got it these guys have got it together. Yet in reality, they're a non-church. They're not lukewarm like Laodicea. They're not mostly dead. They're dead. You walk up to them as a corpse, you try to strike up a conversation, it's going to be a monologue. Jesus has nothing good to say about this church. And again, I notice it's getting real quiet in here. And it should. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Now, is everybody in this church in that boat? No. So, verse 2, wake up and strengthen the things. So here again, he's made the accusation. The accusation is, you think you're alive, you're dead. So, to those, if you jump down, in fact, let's just read it and then we can pick out. Verse 2, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You've gotten the impression from some, from some of these other letters, that the majority of the people that are there are in good shape, and you have a minority that are causing the trouble, right? Not in Sardis. In Sardis, it's the other way around. The vast majority of the church is dead. And you've got a few people who are kind of like the embers in your wood stove when the fire's been out for a couple of days. There's a few coals that are still in there. But you're going to have to do something with them because otherwise what's going to happen to them? They're going to die. And that's, that's, and that's really what he's getting into. So he's got no, he's got nothing to commend them for. They're basically, they're, this is the church that's, this is the first church of the tares. You've heard about First Baptist. You've heard about the first church of the Nazarene. This is the church of the tares. The lookalikes. The fakes. The pretenders. 
Remember when Jesus told the story of the wheat and the tares. The tares look like the wheat. And you really can't tell them apart until it comes time to when you're producing fruit. And then all of a sudden you find the wheat is fruitful, the tares are not. That's what this church is. They're the church of the tares. And you got a few heads of wheat scattered amongst them. And anything that they do isn't done rightly. Jesus says, I haven't found your works complete in the sight of my God. Now, whether that means that they're doing them with wrong motives, whether it means that they're just, that the things that they're offering in, in worship make God want to hold his nose, that idea, you know, our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God, right? Right? when we bring something that we are offering as our best, is the actually the thing that separates us from him. That's why you can't work your way into heaven. The best that you've got is repugnant to him because it is dripping with unholiness. And that's where this church is. And so he moves straight into exhortation. Now, is he talking to the dead people here or is he talking to the waning embers? He's talking to the waning embers here. And for them, first, wake up. You're sleepwalking. Wake up. Fan the flames. Don't just let things die. Remember what you have received and heard. Now here's a beautiful thing actually. The idea here, what is, what is it that they have received? What do they possess physically? And, and by, that, by this point in time, they're starting to actually possess it physically. They're starting to get to where they have God's word physically. It's in circulation. There are letters that have been written to churches. There are, there are things that Paul has written Gospels have been produced. John has been writing. They have God's word in their hand. And not only do they have God's word in their hand, they also have men who have proclaimed it to them. They've had teaching. And so go back to what you have received. Go back to what you've heard and even that is not sufficient. It is not enough to go back and get our Bibles and look and see what it is that God commands. There's something else that needs to be done. And what would that be? You've heard the word, now do it. Nike, just do it, right? Don't be one of those who are deceived, who read but don't, but don't do. And so, go back. Go back to the word, obey it, and repent. Boy, when, you, when, you, when all of a sudden the spotlight comes on and ooh, I'm busted. Don't try to rearrange the furniture. I'm gonna if I, see if I put if I put the dresser over here, that will block the light from coming over, and I can have this stashed back over here. No. 
Don't hide it. Don't ignore it. Don't sweep it under the rug. Deal with it. When you're in sin, repent. Some time ago, we looked at Matthew 18. And out of Matthew 18, we took two basic principles. Christians forgive, right? What else do Christians do? They repent. That's why there's progressive church discipline. When you have somebody who's in sin and they continually refuse to repent, ultimately, how do you deal with that person? You deal with them as a Gentile and a tax collector. Back in that day, it's you treat him as somebody who does not belong. You treat him as an unbeliever. Why? Because they're acting like one. They're not repenting. Don't be that way. And if you don't, judgment's coming. I'm going to come like a thief. I'm going to show up like the Persian soldiers. Because you're not paying attention. I'll show up in your midst, and you won't have any idea that I'm there. Do you see? (laughs) God twice brought enemies into this city to prepare them for this message. Persia was 300 years maybe even 400, before this letter was being written. God is bringing all of those things about. And and, and, and you notice, we've seen this before as we see these letters. He's actually drawing on the history of that area so that it's in their minds, so that they can see, wait a minute, this has happened here, this has happened here. These were very bad when these things happened. So maybe we need to do something differently so that we don't end up in that position. Now there are a few there in Sardis who have white garments. Now, when you live in a dusty environment, what is very difficult to maintain Yeah, and if it's cleanliness, how hard is it to keep something white when you're walking everywhere? And so this idea of white, that's about purity. That's about being clean. And in fact, how, how, how are the people, how are the saints pictured when they're coming with Jesus to judge the earth? They're on white horses and they're dressed in white garments. And they're going to keep their garments white because they actually don't do any of the judging. Jesus does all of that himself. That's why his robe is what? Dipped in blood. And again, if you want to look at white garments, you can go to Isaiah 64, 6, that's talking about our righteousness is as dirty rags, filthy rags. You can go to Jude 23, which is talking about hating the garment that is even spotted by the flesh. You could even go to James 1 uh, for that. And then overcomers, and we got to deal with this briefly. This is one that has caused a lot of questions for folks, and there's actually a pretty straightforward answer to this issue. Verse five, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life. 
and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Anybody a little nervous with that comment? Not a little. Okay, so there's two ways to look at this statement. One is to look at it as a threat. What's the threat? If you do not obey, then your name can get taken out of the book of life. That is one way to view this. And immediately that starts causing issues, doesn't it? Because if you look later in the book of Revelation, you look at chapter 13, verse 8, chapter 17, verse 8, both have the same characteristic when it comes to the book of life as, and as to when your name gets in there. When is your name written in the book of life? Actually, let me rephrase the question. When was your name written in the book of life? Before the foundation of the world. Before there was any created thing. Which actually is an incredibly cool thought. Before there was anything. The names of the redeemed, the names of the elect were already in God's book. If you look at it as a threat, then you are going to be perpetually, perpetually, you will never have a day of peace, ever. When's the last day that you didn't sin? I don't have one. And so if I look at it as a threat, I am consistently waiting for that shoe to fall, for that ax to drop. And it would. If I could lose my salvation, I'd have lost it a long time ago. Thank God it isn't up to me to keep. So if you look at it as a threat, you're always going to be looking over your shoulder. There's another way to view it. You can look at it as a promise. The promise is, my name's there, written by God before I ever was. And what keeps me there? He does. And there is nothing There is nobody, there is no way that my name comes out of that book. That doesn't give me license to sin. In fact, it should have the exact opposite result, right? I'm not going to sin. Why would I do things that would cause grief to the one who bought me? And so it's not a threat, it's a promise. That's one we can take to the bank. Susie. I'm just so stuck on how he addresses who he is. And to me it's such a comfort because of the fact that the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and you're saying that that's meaning of the one who knows. He knows Yep. And so he's the one. He's already saying, who's the one that's speaking to you? It's the one I know. I know that you're mine, and so I want to poke you and wake you up. Mm-hmm. To, I don't know. I just keep coming back to the way that, who, how he addresses himself, how he describes himself as the one who's addressing them. He already knows mm-hmm. where you are, that you are in the book, right? Well, you're not. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Calling us to himself. I don't know. I just keep having to see how people start how he refers to himself and then how he 
Absolutely. Everything's integrated. How he, how he reveals, you know, look, this is who you're dealing with. When God looks at you and says, I know your works. He not only knows what we've done, he knows why we did them, right? His word is able to pierce through and identify the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. And so, again, this is, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And look, even here with the church, that the church as a whole is a non-church. And yet, what's he doing to those who are in the midst of that, who are faithful to him? Look, here's how you're going to be able to finish well. I'll get you there. You have to do your part. You have to take responsibility for your thoughts, your beliefs, your attitudes, your actions. But I will get you there. <laughs> yeah. Go yeah. Being should go beyond. And he said, wait, don't be excited about that. Be excited that your name is written in the book of life. Yeah. Did you hear what Kathleen just said? Kathleen says it reminds her of Jesus when he sends the disciples out two by two. And they come back and they say, we've been able to cast out demons. We've been able to do all of these things. And they are just, you know, they are amped. And what's Jesus' response to them? Don't be excited that you have those things. Don't be excited that you can do those things for me. Be excited that your names are written in the book of life. Let's, it's 1010, let's pray. Father, what a note to end on. That our names are written in your book. In the end of time when when the day of judgment is going to come, we will not stand to be judged as the others because our names are in that book. Thank you that you're our dad. You, you weren't only, you're not only the judge, but for us, you also bore our, you bore our punishment. That was poured out in its fullness on the Lord Jesus who took it willingly. And you're keeping us for that day when we're going to be able to be with you forever. Lord, for our part, help us to be faithful. That we would be diligent students of your word, that we would sit under your teaching and that we would take that and we would use it as a microscope to reveal those places where we are at fault, where we are still yielding ourselves up to sin. Father, thank you that you've given us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. You've held nothing back there. And whereas we don't know the specific dates and times that some of these things that we're going to be studying are going to occur, you've let us know that that's what's coming. There's judgment coming on this earth. There's judgment coming on those who still rebel against you. Help us to be faithful in speaking your truth. Help us to be faithful in living it that we would not be hypocrites and help us to be those who repent and forgive. That people may see that it's different when you're redeemed. Help us to worship you aright this morning as we come. In Jesus' name, amen.